And thank you so very much. Kids, won't you come up? Thanks, sir. Good morning. How's everybody? Good, good, good. Okay. Let's see. How many of you wear these? Got a couple of you, Mason. Aiden, you used to? You don't anymore? You broke them. Okay, that happens. Okay. Soon you will? Okay. So some of us have to wear these. I, I wear contacts, and without either these, the glasses, or my contacts, I can't see. I, you know, people three feet away from me, I'm like, mm, who are you? <laughs> uh, I couldn't see to read the words up on the screen or, or in my Bible. So some of us need these to make things clearer. You know, in our Christian walk, we're, we've been given a gift, something that helps us to see things clearer. When we read our scriptures, we understand better. When we see people in need, it's the prompting of the Holy Spirit that helps us to know those people are needy. So in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, did I not get it to you, Jason? There it is. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. What do you think that means up there? The eyes of your heart. What in the world is he talking about? Can, does our heart have eyes? No, it does not. But we can see with our heart sometimes when people need things. We can understand what we're reading. We can praise and worship because our heart is filled with the love of God and joy. So just like our glasses here on earth can help us see things clearer, the Holy Spirit helps us see things clearer and understand what God wants us to be doing. Okay? All right. I think uh, little stay here today, right, with parents. And Tween Church can come with me. All right. Thank you, guys. Everybody had a, a great week in VBS this week. And I saw a couple of yawns up here this morning. And so I'm sure that there will be a, a recovery time uh, from VBS, not only from the kids, but for the adults who are, who are here. And just what an amazing an amazing week that we had of, of VBS. This place was, was packed and rocking with kids every night. I think we had uh, 73 one night, 75 another night, and so I think we were averaged uh, pretty much those numbers. Tuesday night we canceled because of the flooding. We had several teachers and workers that, that were not able to get here, so we did, so we canceled uh, Tuesday night. Um, but <clears throat> There was, just, there was just something very special that, that happened here. And, uh, you know, when you, when you've, when you experience the, the presence of God, it's a tangible thing that you, can, that you can experience. And that happened here. And we know that the seeds of the gospel that were, were sown, will, they'll come to fruition. We know, we know that they will. And so... It's a, it was just a wonderful week, and uh, we're worn out, but it's a, good, it's a good worn out, right? And so um, I've asked Crystal to be prepared just to share a few things this morning, and uh, Crystal worked so hard for, for so long to, to organize and to, uh, to head VBS, and Brittany was so helpful as well, and Chris in the kitchen, and, and the teachers all working together to make VBS just a resounding uh, success. And um, so, just so I'm so thankful for, for you all. So Crystal, if you want to come up and, and share something, and if you, anybody else that was involved in VBS wants to share something, you're going to have uh, an opportunity to. I want, I want anybody who has something to share. 
Yeah. yeah. I just wrote a few things down so I didn't forget anything. Um, the first thing I want to say is thank you, thank you to every single one of you that helped in any way with BBS. It was either with donations, teaching, the kitchen, or praying for us. Um, it was just a fun-filled, adventurous, crazy, joyous, exhausting um, but heart-filled week of VBS. But thank you. Thank you to every single one that helped in any way. I, I'm just amazed of how well this church family is. I have never seen so many people come together just to help one another. So thank you. Um, VBS is basically a once a year of making sure we have all those kids come into our church that don't go to church. Um, we do not know what their home life is like. And so we want to make sure that every single kid that walks those doors, um, we plant the seed of faith in them as often as we can. We want to show those kids how much we love them, how much Jesus loves them, um, and I tell you, those kids, they were just amazing. They were. They were just so much fun. Um, but making sure having those kids here this week, um, like I said, we don't know what goes on outside this church with them. And we know that kids today are just bombarded with challenges of what the Bible teaches. And like from TV shows to watch, books they're picking up from the library, the enemy is at work infiltrating every area of childhood. So kids don't know what is true anymore, but we do. And our job this week was to share with them what the truth is. And that's Jesus loves them. Um, I mean, I really don't know what else to say. I just know it was a great week. We had lots and lots of kids kids um but my favorite part was watching the kids come in here and just worshiping watching them sing and dance and then of course when gay play praise woo! i mean we had boys over there dancing in a little circle and they were just singing praise at the top of their lungs that was just i loved it um but yeah just seeing them get up singing dancing and worshiping that was the favorite and, of course, I got to act like a kid this week. I was supposed to be a leader, but uh, uh, I also got to act like a kid. So that was another part of my favorite thing of BBS. So. Um, but, again, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody that helped in any way. I love you all so much. I tried to make sure that I gave you hugs to everybody that helped. If I miss you, come see me. I'll hug you. All right, Brittany, your turn. So you're, you're saying that normally you don't act like a kid? I think, it, I think it should have been this week that you got to act like a leader. You did, you did a fantastic job. You got so much thrown at you that, I mean, day one of EBS, if you guys have ever experienced EBS, day one is always the day where you learn how to fly by the seat of your pants because everything that will go wrong will go wrong. And you just did an amazing job. So thank you for stepping into that role and, and heading it up. Um, <clears throat> this is my fifth or sixth VBS at this church. <laughs> This is the first time I've been upstairs. <laughs> it's a completely different world upstairs for BBS than downstairs in crafts, which is also fun. But <laughs> I got to experience the singing and the welcome. I got to help out in the kitchen, got to eat snacks before midnight. It was great. It was really great. Um, but. I just, again, like Crystal said, I am just utterly amazed at how we can all come together and just 
put on this show for the kids because they don't know what to expect when they walk in these doors. Some of them have never been to VBS before, and some of them have. Some of them have never heard the name of Jesus, and so they're just kind of piece things together as they go. And everybody has just kind of come alongside each other. There have been people talking about Jesus, explaining who he is and what he's done. People have been sharing their testimonies, how Jesus has showed up in their lives. And the kids just, you can see their eyes open the farther along it went in the week. And from the first day to the last day, the amount of kids that were in here just raising their hands and they were jumping, singing, praise the Lord. And it just, it kind of melts your heart because even if, even if it was just a show to them, they're going to remember it. There's memories and sounds like you know, you guys know the music that you listened to when you were 13 years old. You know the lyrics. And we don't listen to that music no more unless you jam it out. But just think about that. Like, these are the songs that our kids are going to remember when they're in their 30s and 40s. And they're going to think, oh, I remember this song. And they're going to remember how they felt during that. And it's so awesome. And to be part of that, to be alongside you guys and to get dirty and to have to rearrange things and fly by the seat of your pants. Like, it's just, it's so good to be in a family. So thank you, all of you. And it's one more thing. It took a long time, a lot of preparation to get VBS up and going. There were a lot of new faces that haven't helped out before. And they jumped in and they helped. But let me tell you, y'all tear down really fast. <laughs> I was in there eating and I come back in here and the stage looked like this. I'm like, where'd the waterfall go? Exactly. One week, <laughs> one hour to take care. I know, it's just crazy. It's like magic. All right, thank you guys. Thank you guys. And one of the things that um, well, it was one of the focal points of, of the week is to, uh, to raise money for a local ministry. And uh, we chose the Family Life Shelter here in Mount Vernon that they just do a wonderful job showing Jesus to people. And if you know anything about them at all, they, they, they provide a, a bed to sleep on, uh, meals, they help them find a job. They help them get back on their, their feet. And, and uh, we, we, we raised $890 for them this week. And Pastor Kent Jackson came Friday night to family night to, re to receive that, that check. And, and he, was, uh, he was blown away, very, very thankful. And um, Matt and I got our hair painted. Uh, pink because the girls because the girls won and so uh, Matt doesn't have much hair up here it's his law right here you know so he got a so he got a, a, a pink forehead and a pink beard and um, and then mine was uh, mine was painted as well and it was a, just a great a great week and so just very grateful for everybody who who pitched in to help and so We'll give it a little bit of a rest, and then we'll start planning for next year, right? <laughs> we do have, there are other churches in the area that are doing uh, the, what's it called, Jungle, jungle, jungle Journey uh, uh, next week. So we have some, some of our t-shirts left over that we're going we're gonna to offer to them if they would like to, uh, to have them. So anyway, it's all about working together, right? It is. Amen. God, God is good. I'm very, very, very grateful. Well, I want to I want to continue talking about uh, Romans, and today we're going to be in Romans chapter five, and we're going to look at 
two verses, the first two verses of Romans chapter 5, and a very simple uh, title to today's message is, is Peace with God. Peace with God, very simple but very powerful, to have peace with God. Let's look at the first two verses of Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of of God. So Lord, we thank you for these moments that you've given us today to hear testimony of your, of your goodness and the work that you are doing. To your name alone be the glory. We thank you, Lord. And now for these moments that we hear your word, <clears throat> I pray that you would, you would help me to, to speak it clearly and that, Lord, there would be ears to hear and, and eyes of understanding, as Melanie talked about, eyes of understanding that would be opened today. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we talked about uh, God calling Abram to, uh, to an unknown land. And I think that would scare all of us to death if we knew that God was calling us to go to a land that was unknown to us, that he would, that he would eventually show us. But by faith, by faith, Abram did as the Lord commanded, Scripture says. And when God established his covenant with Abram, he changed his name to Abraham, promising to make him the father of, of many nations. And, and Abraham was obedient to do, he was obedient to do all that God commanded him to do. So it wasn't by, by works, it wasn't his doing that justified him or made him right in God's eyes. It's his doing, his doing of works was rooted in his faith in God. Romans 4 verse 3 from last week says, for what the scriptures say, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. His works did not make him righteous. His belief in God, his faith is what made him righteous or acceptable in the eyes of God. And as chapter 4 brought light to, to salvation by faith alone, even in, in the Old Testament, Abraham's righteousness was in his faith and believe in God, not in his works. And this morning, we'll see that in chapter 5, Paul takes it to another level. He steps it up, proclaiming that our righteousness is in faith in Jesus Christ alone. And in Christ, we no longer live in, in fear of judgment, of sin. We shouldn't anyway. We no longer fear the wrath of God against sin because Jesus took the wrath of God upon himself on the cross to pay for sin. And Paul says we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Being in right standing brings peace. I can't, I can't overstate that. Being in right standing with God brings the peace of God into our lives. And in this instance, uh, I believe we can look at, at this peace of God in, in, a, in a couple of ways. And let me explain. That since we are made right by faith, justified while we are made right in faith in Jesus, you could say that the war is over. Amen? The war against sin is over. Before Christ, we were, we were enemies of God. We, we were sinful. By nature, we were sinful. We were at odds with God, and we were considered enemies of God in our flesh, in our ungodliness. We rejected God. We lived only to please ourselves. And I'll call that the pre-Christ mode. In pre-Christ mode, there was, there was hostility between God and man. Before you were saved, there's hostility between you and God. Why? 
Because of sin. Conflict. Opposition. Because of sin. The root cause of, of separation of man from God. Sin. And with that separation and that conflict, the battle is continuous. And I know some people that, that that's where they are. You know, still running from, running from God, that, that battle is, is continuous. There's no peace. There's no rest. And if we look ahead just a few verses in, in chapter 5, look ahead to verse 10. Paul says, if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. And being justified by faith in Jesus. Don't you love the, it's a, it's a settling. It's a settling in my, in, in my spirit. Even in my mind, there is a settling that things are right because of Jesus. Knowing that the war is over. No longer an enemy of God. That inner, inner battle. Now, it's not to say that, that, that it never happens, right? We struggle. We all, we all struggle from, from time to time. But we have peace. I liken it to when friends make amends after a dispute or there's a misunderstanding or there's even a, a long time feud. It could be between friends, it could be family members, it could be. Co-workers, how many times have you yourself or have you seen these, these disputes that happen? But when there's reconciliation, peace returns. And there's a, a settling that things have been made right again. And I'm sure that there are some this morning that are here that you need to be reconciled to a friend. I could, I, could, I could look each and every one of you in the eye this morning and say, there's probably somebody in your life that you need to be reconciled with, whether it's a friend, whether it's a, a parent, whether it's a, a coworker, or a, a relative. Whatever your situation is, I'm sure that there's somebody in your life that you need to be reconciled with. Do what's right what I tell you to do. Do what's right so that the inner battle comes to an end in your life. And when there's discord in a marriage, and this, and this affects everybody. If you're married, this affects you. There's nothing worse in your life than when peace is missing from your marriage. That inner and outer emotional conflict, it's real. And as long as there are unresolved issues, peace will elude you. It won't come. Husbands, love your wife. Love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. That's Ephesians 6. Husbands, see to it that your wife is happy. See to it that your wife is contented. Husbands, see to it that your wife feels safe and that she is provided for. Pastor, is that really my responsibility? Yes. 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 Husbands, see to it. See to it. If you want peace and joy in your marriage, it starts with you. It starts with me and my marriage. If you want peace in your marriage, it starts with you, husband. Wives, you're welcome. Having said that, wives... Stop being critical to your husband. It makes him feel like a failure. It 
Stop nitpicking everything he does. As he makes every effort to care for you, to make you happy, to make you content, to protect you, you respond to him with loving respect, with kindness and support. That's how you have peace in your marriage. By supporting each other, by submitting to one another, caring for one another, giving to one another. Marriage is not give and take. Marriage is give and give and give and give and give and give and give. And And the response is to receive, to receive, to receive, and to receive. Be a giver in your marriage. That's how you have peace. Conflict with God exists because of sin. Peace with God comes through forgiveness of sin through faith in Jesus. Verse 2 today. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. (laughs) There's a lot there in that one verse. There's a lot there. So not only do we have peace with God through Jesus, but Paul says in addition to peace with God, we also have full access to his grace. The grace of God. Well, it's amazing, as you know, God's amazing grace. The grace of God that is ours in Christ. There's a Bible teacher, scholar named William McDonald, and he calls God's grace an indescribable position of favor with God. Favor with God that is beyond description. And this grace in which we stand is our eternally secure position in Christ. I want you to hear that, and I want you to understand that, that our position in Christ through his amazing grace is our eternally secure position in Christ. Because we are completely forgiven, we are completely made right in his sight for all of eternity. And it's completely undeserved. But his grace is sufficient. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, this is my, this is my favorite, one of my favorite verses to, to, to quote in church, and I do it so often. By grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's the gift of God and not a result of works so that no one can boast. You didn't do anything to earn it. God's grace, his salvation, it's the free gift of God that has to be received, right? Through confession. Let me tell you something else about this grace, this grace in which we stand, what it means. Not only does it mean that we are completely accepted by God through faith in Jesus. And this is something you need need to get it to. But it also means that you and I, in Christ, by his grace, we are as near and dear to God as he is his beloved son. In this grace in which we stand, we are welcomed as sons and daughters. We are co-heirs with Jesus in an, with an eternal inheritance that will never fade. It will never go away. It will never end. In God's eyes, our relationship with him is as perfect and permanent 
as it is with his own son. Isn't that amazing? Why? Because we are in his son. John 17 records the high priestly prayer of Jesus. John 17, make note of it, read it. I'll make that your, your homework this week. John 17, the priestly prayer, prayer of Jesus. Verses 22 and 23, he says this. He's, this is the prayer of Jesus that the glory that you have given me, I have given to them. That they may be one even as we are one. I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Powerful. Billy Sprague is a favorite singer-songwriter of mine from the, from the 80s and 90s. And he has a song called, How Can You Say No? And it goes... If Christ himself were standing here, his face full of glory, his eyes full of tears, and he held out his arms and his nail-printed hands, is there any way you could say no to this man? How could you look into his Tear-stained eyes, knowing that it's you he's thinking of. Could you tell him you're not ready now to give him your life? Could you say that you don't think you need his love? Jesus is here with his arms open wide. You can see him with your heart if you'll stop looking with your eyes. He's left it up to you. He's done all that he can. Is there any way you could say no to this man? Knowing what Jesus did to secure our salvation, Enduring the cross, in Hebrews, Jesus endured the cross, the shame of the cross, because of the glory, the joy that was on the other side of it, right? Knowing what Jesus did to secure our salvation, is there any way that you could say no to this man? If you're already a follower of Jesus, but you feel stuck, how often do you feel that way? in your life. You just feel stuck. And it's not, it's not uncommon. This is my encouragement to you. Don't wait around to become magically unstuck. Active prayer, Bible study are, are, are key, but this is also my encouragement to you to do something that will get you unstuck. Do Something that will get you unstuck. Do things that will glorify God in your life. You'll get, you'll get unstuck. Put the goodness of God on display for others to see. Not for your gain, but for the glory of God. In 2 Timothy, this is what Paul tells Timothy to do. 2 Timothy 1.6. He says, for this reason, he's talking to Timothy. You need to do this. He says, fan into flame the gift of God in your life, which is in you through the laying out of my hands. So he's telling, he's telling Timothy, you need to do something to fan the flame in your life. Don't just sit around. Don't just sit around and wait for something magical to happen. But do something. Get up and do something. Do something of sacrifice that will help someone else. And you will experience the goodness of God in your life. And you'll become unstuck. I guarantee it. I promise you. And if you're 
here this morning and you've not yet surrendered to God, you've not yet repented of sin, you've not yet believed on Jesus, this is what Scripture says. Behold, now is the accepted time. Today. Today is the day of salvation. So I, so I ask, what's, what's holding you back? Because you can have peace with God through faith in Jesus, but peace won't come until you surrender to Jesus. In Jesus, the war over sin has, has been won. But we face the battles every day, right? Every day we face the battle of, of, of sin, and sin will creep in. Temptation will creep in. But the power and the curse of sin has been defeated forever in Jesus. But you must come to him, and you must surrender your will to his. Because Jesus is here with his arms open, open wide. You can see him with your heart if you'll stop looking with your eyes. And he's left it up to you. Because he's done all that he can. So is there any way you could say no to this man? Let's pray. Thank you, God, for, for your word today for the blessing of, of being in your presence, for the blessing of being with others in Christ. Lord, for the challenge of your word that sometimes is not easy to hear because it puts us in a place to obey when we don't feel like it. So Lord, I pray that you would have your way this morning as we... As we as we go to a time of, of response and invitation, thank you, Lord. Have your perfect way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand?